The 58-year-old claims she suffered emotional distress over the character of Martha, a relentless stalker. Seven, seven out of 500,000. Se seven sites, and then, yes, that is pathetic. Okay, I don't disagree. The math disagrees. The next phase of feminism is creating a matriarchy. Netflix gets hit with a $170 million lawsuit and might just be screwed. A Democratic senator admits to a big Biden failure. Canada's conservative leader goes off and a woke TikToker thinks we need a matriarchy. <laughs> All that and so much more is coming up on today's episode of Brad vs. Everyone, my daily series where I take on the craziest ideas from across our politics and across the internet from a center-right, independent perspective. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and sticking around. And if you're a returning viewer, you know what I'm going to say. Don't forget to hit that like button and do comment with your thoughts as we go along. I do read the comments and I pick a few to respond to in every episode. Now up first, Netflix just got slapped with a $170 million defamation lawsuit over its new hit series, Baby Reindeer. I've watched a little bit of this series and more importantly, I've closely covered the fallout from it. And well, we'll have to wait and see how it plays out in court. I think Netflix might just be screwed. Here's an update from ABC7 News. The woman who said she inspired a character on the hit show Baby Reindeer is now suing Netflix. According to documents filed in Los Angeles court today, Fiona Harvey is seeking more than $170 million in damages. The 58-year-old claims she suffered emotional distress over the character of Martha, a relentless stalker. While Harvey has said publicly the character is based on her, she disputes the show's version of events. A spokesperson for Netflix told us, quote, we intend to defend this matter vigorously and stand by Richard Gadd's right to tell his story. Now, you absolutely do have a right to tell your story, but you still can't lie about people. And that's where this controversy gets interesting. For context, the show Baby Reindeer is about Richard Gadd, the show's Scottish creator who plays himself. He's working at a pub when he meets a woman named Martha, and their chance encounter quickly descends into a pretty gripping and honestly kind of harrowing stocking tale. This messy affair that features two deeply broken characters and concludes with Martha sentenced to jail time. Now, if the series had been billed as fictional, the story would have stopped there, and Netflix probably would have ridden the show's massive success to a huge payday and multiple awards. Yet the very first episode of Baby Reindeer opens with the preface, this is a true story. Not that it was based on a true story. Not that it was a fictionalized account loosely based on true events. But they said it was a true story. Full stop. And Netflix's website describes the show as a true story over and over and over again. A Netflix executive even testified before the British Parliament that it was, quote, obviously a true story of the horrific abuse that the writer and protagonist Richard God suffered at the hands of a convicted stalker. Remember, that word convicted. Now, none of this would have really mattered if the identity of Martha had stayed a secret. They did change her name and some other key details, and Netflix claimed that they had done all they could to shield her true identity. But Twitter activity included in this series that was almost verbatim from real life allowed internet sleuths to quickly identify the real world Martha, Fiona Harvey, almost immediately after the show's release. So of course, after being depicted as a completely deranged and dangerous stalker to millions of people, Harvey's reputation took a huge hit and she received tons of harassment and hate and threats online. Of course, if the story was 100% accurate, then Netflix would have the ultimate defense, truth. But it seems that at least part of this story may have been fabricated, but not out of whole cloth. Fiona Harvey's alleged stalking behavior has been extensively corroborated by other victims. That said, in the supposedly true story of Baby Reindeer, Martha, aka Fiona Harvey, is repeatedly described as somebody who had been previously convicted for stalking and served jail time. And the show concludes with her confessing and being sentenced to jail time. Yet Harvey denies that this ever happened. And much more importantly than just taking the word and the denials of somebody who frankly doesn't have a lot of credibility, journalists ever since this controversy emerged have searched and searched for any record of these convictions or these jail sentences and come up empty. 
As the BBC reports, the lawsuit includes a photo of a background check and a certificate that claims Miss Harvey has no criminal convictions on her record. So all signs suggest that at least part of the story, where she confesses and is convicted and sent to jail, may never have actually happened. And another thing that's depicted in the show is Martha having stalked somebody previously and been convicted and sentenced to jail for that. But this narrative has been refuted by the alleged previous stalking victim herself, who says that while Fiona did stalk her, and a lot of the behavioral patterns that are described in the show ring true, there was never a criminal case against her, and as far as she knows, she was never convicted or sent to jail. And it's very hard to imagine that that could have happened without the alleged victim knowing. All this is why Fiona Harvey is now suing Netflix for more than $170 million in a defamation case. And unless some evidence turns up that she actually was convicted of these crimes, it seems like she's got a case to me. You can't simply depict somebody as a convicted criminal to sensationalize a story so you can make millions of dollars when they are not. That's not just a deeply immoral thing to do, but especially when that person isn't even a public figure, they're just a random private citizen, it puts you into serious legal jeopardy and defamation grounds. From totally failing to adequately shield this woman's identity to apparently failing to fact check many of the claims made in this true story, Netflix does not look good from this whole saga. And if you ask me, they really need to decide. Are they in the business of entertainment or the business of journalism? And if they blurred the lines recklessly with baby reindeer, they should be held accountable in court. But that's just my take. Let me know what you think in the comments below, especially if you've seen the series or you've followed this drama. Personally, I've been a little bit hooked to the online discourse over this and followed the twists and turns. And the conclusion that I've honestly reached is that I think she probably was a stalker and probably did do a lot of this deranged behavior, but I think they exaggerated the story and fabricated parts of it. And if they did, that's wrong. Up next, a Democratic senator just called out the Biden administration for one of their massive failures. We covered this on the show a little while back, but the Biden administration has been getting serious heat for the fact that they allocated billions of taxpayer dollars to the construction of new electrical vehicle charging ports, but reportedly only seven out of 500,000 have actually been built several years later. This failure is so glaring that even members of the president's own party are calling him out. Let's take a look at an exchange that the Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley had with a Biden transportation official. The question was, the infrastructure bill funded 500,000, as you put it, charging ports. How many of those charging ports have been deployed? So of the bipartisan infrastructure law yes. funds? Yes. So six states have uh, deployed NEVI funds. Uh, I, I'll say it's dozens of ports, so under 100, like of those six uh, uh, Nevi sites that are out there. It is dozens of charging ports. I can get you the specific number. Okay, yeah, if you could, because I've heard it only seven. Seven, seven out of 500,000. Se seven sites, and then, yes. That is pathetic. Like, we're now three years into this. Now, if you come out to, to my state, and you're looking to drive an electric vehicle around the state, even utilizing just those that are near the major highways, not a single one's been built. Not one. Three years in, not one. What's the problem? Uh, well, thank you, Senator. And I, I share your frustration around the speed of the deployment here. So guys, you know something is bad when even members of a president's own party, and frankly, let's be honest, they're usually partisan shills. They usually just shill for their team, come out and say, it's pathetic. They've spent billions of dollars and barely built any of the 500,000 charging ports we were supposed to have several years later. It is pathetic. It is disgraceful. But it's just another reminder of how inefficient this government bureaucracy is and how naive the idea that just giving them trillions more dollars to waste and entrusting these bureaucracies with more power and more authority is ever really going to solve complicated or nuanced problems. They can't even build charging ports. Oh, this is the stuff that makes me so angry when it's time to pay my taxes because I just know most of it's not being used effectively. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Up next, we've got to talk about the Canadian conservative politician Pierre Polyev, who just absolutely went 
off. He was asked about the liberal left-wing Trudeau administration and their approach to housing policy, and Polyev explained pretty brilliantly why this big government approach doesn't work. Take a look. My question is regarding the housing problem. CHMC has said that Canada needs 5.8 million houses to restore the housing affordability. Liberals say that they have that already in the budget to be focused on the um, the housing and the fairness for the Canadians, which you disagree. Why do you disagree and what's your plan? Okay, I don't disagree. The math disagrees. They've promised they're going to build, so they promised they're going to double home building. Their own housing agency said since they made that promise, home building has gone down. And that it will go down next year and the year after that. Look at my exchange with Trudeau in the House of Commons this week, last week. To get to 3.9 million, forget 5.9 million, to get to 3.9 million new homes by the scheduled deadline of 2031 that Trudeau promised, he needs to build 550,000 homes a year. I asked him six times in the House of Commons, are we going to build 550,000 homes this year? He wouldn't answer. Well, the truth is he's on track right now to building about 200,000 homes, not even half of what he's promised. It's a matter, matter of me disagreeing. It's a mathematical fact. He's not delivering. It's a mathematical fact that nine years ago when I was housing minister, the average rent for a one bedroom was $973. Now it's 2,000. Right? Th th these are the facts. So you can, has he spent a lot of money on housing programs? Yes. He spent $89 billion on housing affordability, and the result is that housing costs have doubled. The problem is he's putting the money into bureaucracy. Government bureaucrats don't build homes. Private sector builders do. Government bureaucrats are in the way. So we need to get the government bureaucracy out of the way and deliver fast, affordable permits to build the homes. One third of the cost of every newly built home in Ontario is government permits and taxes. One third. That's more than we spend on the labor to build the home. So we're spending more on the bureaucrats who don't build anything than we do on the carpenters, framers, plumbers, and electricians who build. Isn't that insane? Like when you buy a house, do you not find it incredible? You have this beautiful house. And you say, well, where did the money, I'm buying the house for, now it's a, say it's a million dollars. What does the million dollars go to? You know, you break it down, lumber, materials. You think more money goes to people sitting in government offices than goes to the people swinging the hammers, fitting the pipes, framing the, 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 the lumber. It doesn't make sense. We need to cut the bureaucracy, and that's why my common sense plan will require cities free up land, speed up permits, cut development charges and fees as a condition of getting federal funds. If they don't hit my targets, they won't get their money, and there'll be less of those bureaucrats in those corner offices. So if they beat the target, they'll get more money. We're going to pay our municipalities the way we pay realtors and builders for the number of homes. Honestly, inject every word of what was just played, inject it into my veins, guys. Not only is he totally correct about this issue, that both in Canada and in the United States, housing is way too expensive, but it's largely so because of extensive restrictions on the supply of housing. We've limited the market's ability to increase the supply, which reduces prices. And government housing programs are money funnels with bottomless pits that very rarely work efficiently or effectively. But the main reason I wanted to show this to you guys and talk about Polyev is that one, I got kind of hot under the collar listening to this. No, I'm kidding. But like, come on. And two, can you think of a single conservative or Republican mainstream popular leader in America who can articulate right of center ideas and speak this powerfully and precisely about policies? I really can't. I just can't. We need an American version of this guy and we need him like yesterday. To my Canadian followers, is there something I don't know about him or is he actually like kind of based? Let me know in the comments.
Up next, it's time for Brad vs. TikTok, my series where I take on the craziest ideas going viral on the Clock app. Don't forget to subscribe and stick around and like the video if you're getting a kick out of it so far. And now, let's take a look at a TikTok from one woke TikToker who thinks we need a matriarchal society with women in charge and in control of everything. So I shared this post on my other account on Instagram about why the next phase of feminism is creating a matriarchy and it reached almost 2 million people. Here's why I think a matriarchy is the future and absolutely essential if we want to live literally live on this planet. I created this oh. very handy- Okay, so just to be clear, we are no longer talking about equality. This TikTok feminist's idea is to rip up the original definition of feminism of equality between the sexes and instead openly wants women to dominate society and be at the top. Kind of sounds like becoming the thing you hate in just a reverse direction, but Okay, I guess. Let's keep hearing her out. Andy graphic that shows exactly what a patriarchy is. It's a triangle, it's a hierarchy, where in our society, rich, white, cis men are at the top and everyone else is organized by how much or how little power their intersecting identities give them. The etymology of the word patriarchy literally means the domination of the fathers. And archy in this situation means domination as in monarch or archbishop. This is what we currently live in and it's leading to the climate crisis, it's leading to the extinction of humanity, it's leading to horrible genocides like the oh. one in Gaza. Because it doesn't place value on human life, it doesn't place value or sacredness on life at all. You know guys, some things are so f dumb that only intellectuals and academics can somehow believe them. Like claiming that greed, individualism, and violence only exist because of patriarchy, rather than just being part of human nature. Or like claiming that climate change is only happening because men are in charge and because of the patriarchy. As if global industrialization could have somehow unfolded differently and magical new forms of energy would have been discovered if just women had been running everything. It's all just absurd. A lot of people think matriarchy is just the opposite of patriarchy where women are at the top, but actually that would still be a patriarchy because it's a hierarchy. Well, you see, this is the thing that maddens me about woke people. The dictionary is not a f choose your own adventure game, people. You don't get to just make up your own definitions for words. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, a matriarchy is a hypothetical social system in which the mother or a female elder has absolute authority over the family group, or by extension, one or more women exert a similar level of authority over the community as a whole. AKA, it's just the opposite of a patriarchy with women up top, women in charge. A matriarchy isn't still a patriarchy because it's still a hierarchy. Patriarchy and hierarchy are different words with different meanings. You're just making shit up. Also, the idea that there's ever been any society without some sort of hierarchy is not true. So then everything is patriarchy always by your definition. Like you're literally just word babbling. But because you use flowery academic language, you somehow are able to pass yourself off as if you're making some profound point when you're literally speaking gibberish. And matriarchy is a societal structure that indigenous people ha still have today, and human society has been matriarchal for far longer than it's been patriarchal. Fact check. False. Many experts argue that while there certainly have been individual matriarchs who led a particular community or a family, a matriarchal civilization has never existed. And the notion that human societies were matriarchal long before they were patriarchal has been dismissed by most anthropologists as a myth. Now, I don't know enough to tell you that nowhere in human history can a matriarchal society ever be found, but it's definitely not something that was ever or ever has been widespread in the way that she's claiming. Again, she's just, just living in a different reality than the rest of us. And part of the power of patriarchy is in convincing us that there's no other alternative. At the core of a matriarchy is the idea that every single human being originates from a mother, Every person was a child at one point, so centering the needs of mothers and children leads to the most just society. Again, 
That's not what matriarchy means. And every person also traces back to a father. So I just don't think the point you made is really a point? Obviously, the needs of women and children are important and society should strongly focus on them. But I still don't understand why we can't just strive for an egalitarian society. It's a society defined by community, reciprocity, and putting the sacredness of life at the core. Going from patriarchy to matriarchy means going from exploitation to regeneration, from domination to love, from greed to reciprocity, and from individualism to community. Okay, now it makes more sense. She just wants communism. <laughs> you know, there's actually something deeply regressive about this suggestion that men are inherently individualistic and greedy, and women are selfless and communitarian. Actually, babe, men and women are individuals with different values and personalities. Some men might be very hyper-individualistic, but so might some women, and vice versa. Human beings are individuals, and people of either sex can be any of these things. There's something weirdly, like, traditionalist and strict gender roles about the woke argument she's supposedly making. I mean, it sounds amazing, right? Creating no. this kind of society is not only possible Actually. because of millennia of human societies functioning this way, like it's our natural way of being, and I truly believe that, but it's no. essential for our survival on this planet. Then I guess we're doomed. You know, guys, I say it a lot, but in this one, I actually mean it. I lost brain cells listening to this TikTok. And I'm guessing that you did too, but you can let me know in the comments. Don't forget to hit that like button to reward me for my suffering, and we'll leave it there on that one for now. Now, before we wrap up today's show and take a break for the weekend, I'll read a few of the comments that you guys left on the last episode. One person says, we can play their game. R2-D2 has always been referred to as a he, so calling him a lesbian is misgendering. Oh, my friend, unfortunately, I don't know if you've heard, but there can be he, him, lesbians now. So checkmate. The wokes do win this one, I guess. If you are gay for Hayden Christensen in the prequels, you are too gay. By contrast, if you are not gay for Ford in the originals, you aren't gay enough. I don't know. I thought, like, in the third movie especially, Hayden Christensen looked pretty good. Another person says, Brad, I've often questioned why felons who serve their time entirely can't vote anymore when they're not excused from paying taxes or following the amendments of policies they don't get to vote on. Where is the room for redemption? It's like a seal being broken as soon as the verdict hits. Yeah, I've always agreed with this. I think that being put in prison means that your rights have been revoked for a time in response to something you've done wrong. But once you're out, you should be restored in most senses as a full functioning member of society, especially when we're talking about nonviolent felonies and things. I agree, you should have your right to vote restored. Someone else says, Brad, did you really major in politics? Well, for those who are curious, I double majored in political science and economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I did a minor in Spanish. All right, everybody, we'll leave it there for today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please make sure you're subscribed and stick around. Don't forget to hit that like button on your way out and comment with your thoughts on today's episode. I do read the comments and I pick a few to respond to in every episode. And with that, that, we'll talk again next week. Uh,